I think the difference is if you have a legitimate, authentic, lived experience, lived experience that is informed by the indigenous reality of today, um, what you're bringing to that script and to what is, in, in, in my world, mostly non-indigenous people, um, it's only your voice that is the one that's standing up for that character. Welcome back, warriors. My name is Pam Palmer, and I am the host of this podcast, The Warrior Life. We cover everything from native sovereignty, treaties, and land back to decolonization, reconciliation, and how to support the struggle. So if you're interested in hearing from native peoples from all over Turtle Island talk about what it's like to be on the front lines of every industry in terms of acting and education and teaching and being lawyers and land defenders and water protectors, then this is the podcast for you. And today's podcast is basically just going to be me fangirling over the incredible guest that we are just about to be to meet. I'm excited to have such an incredible superstar, trailblazer, award-winning person on my podcast. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this one. Welcome back to the Warrior Life Podcast. My name's Pam Palmeter and I'm from the cool Mi'kmaq Nation. And today's podcast is going to be, well, it is one of those unbelievable, but actually true situations. It's unbelievable because we have actually a native superstar that's going to be talking to us, but it's actually true because she's actually here. After many months of me chasing her and using the universe and positive thinking to get her here, we finally have her here. She is just like one of my favorite people ever. So Tamara Podemski is literally, and I'm saying literally, 8,000 things all at once. I mean, literally all rolled into one. And if we were here for the rest of the day, I still couldn't list all of the awards and projects that she has been a part of. Most of you will probably recognize her from her super cool role role as uh, Auntie in Reservation Dogs and as the deputy sheriff in the show Outer Range. Both of those are so cool, but she's done a bazillion more cool things. But before we get into the details, and so to give me some time to calm down, (laughs) let's welcome her to the podcast. Welcome, Tamara. Annie Bojo, hello. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, I am so pumped. I'll try not to be a lawyer and interrogate too much, but I've got a bazillion questions like I usually do. (laughs) But before we get into it, maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit and what nation you're from. Yeah. Um, Tamar Natishnikas, Makwanadodem, Anishinaabekwe, Ashkenazikwe. Um, Toronto, Donjaba, Georgian Bay, and Da, and um, I am uh, I'm uh, far from from my uh, reservation, which is uh, Treaty Four territory, Muscopeding First Nation, in Saskatchewan, where my my mom um, where my mom's from, but uh, we've all been in Ontario uh, for our whole lives, and um, yeah, I. Uh, well, I say all, me, me and my sisters, we grew up here in Ontario and also Anishinaabe territory. And right now I'm, I guess, closest to uh, Beausoleil First Nation. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I left the city a couple of years ago and I live by the lake. And uh, I don't know, it feels like the best decision I ever made, other than choosing my my man and uh, <laughs> our family. <laughs> you got to you got to add those things to the list. The puppy I chose, yeah. the husband I chose, all of my friends. Well, it was just like it was just this culmination of all these big life choices that ended up um oh my gosh, and speak of him who's bringing me a coffee. Thank you, my love. See, perfect. There you go. You got a good one. But I think it was just like I I never 
you know, as many dreams as you have of where you're going to end up, I never would have dreamt this. And yet all these other choices that come into alignment and you end up finding the partner who also, you know, just lives and engages in life in a really kind of high octane like way. And because of that, needs to balance it all out with very quiet kind of land-based um regenerative um in a regenerative environment environment and so yeah we're going on three years now um up here on georgian bay and um it's just it's been blissful oh that's so awesome especially when you know everything is aligned and everything is going good it just gives you the energy yeah. must give you the energy to do the yeah. eight thousand things that you're doing <laughs> On this podcast, I have like a wide range of different types of people that listen, and I have a large group of young listeners who love hearing the life story of people, and they always want me to ask two specific questions. So I'm going to ask them to you, and the, the first one is, was it always your dream to grow up and be a famous actor, writer, producer, <laughs> musician, artist? Um, no. Um, Fame and whatever those pictures of like, I don't know, like Hollywood, that wasn't in my, in my, uh, you know, I, um, even like understanding that that was accessible to me um, or that that was like, that that equaled be, being a successful performer. I knew I always wanted to perform. I knew that I always wanted to <laughs> to, to embody um, characters and tell stories and and connect with audiences, the feeling that I get when I um, when I help people feel things, to me is what I was here to do. So I always knew that I wanted to do that. That was for sure. I never made the connection of like uh, really how to do that, what the career might look like, or that there was. Um, uh, like a, an end an end goal um and or or even like become conclusive about it that that would mean success i i never i never got attached at the same time i have been rehearsing my 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 oscar speech since <laughs> i was about 15 years old but 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 also not in a way that if i didn't get an oscar i would not have been as, like i wasn't successful i i've never made the the connections that this equals that or um, and, and because I think as also just as a, well, as a ethnic actor in, in a, in, at a time when I came up that it was, the opportunities were very restrictive. Mm -hmm. It's not that you learn to limit your dreams based on that, but it's a very early reality check as to what's possible. So I just, I just knew that as long as I could keep in, whether it was in plays or in singing or in community work and teaching, as long as I could do it, I, I didn't, it didn't matter that, you know, it wasn't in, in Hollywood. The Hollywood stuff came so much later. Well, so then there's a part B to that question that okay. I'm just randomly adding. If it wasn't your lifelong dream since you were a little girl to actually be in Hollywood, but, you know, instead be a performer, when did that transition? from being the educator, performer, storyteller into Hollywood? Um, I think I just hit a ceiling here in, in Canada. Um, there, it, it just, it gets tiresome when you actually feel like you're growing and you're getting better and, um, you're working so hard and you're going, you know, whether it's from play to play or, or, and I, and I very rarely had lead roles. I was always a supporting actor or, a, or a guest star role. And so, um, and anyone who, who has kind of been, um, an ensemble player, like not the lead character, but an ensemble player, you know, that we kind of have to work harder <laughs> than, than, than anyone else, because we're either, you know, trying to prove ourselves or, or we're still working our chops. And, and it just got really, um, it just got really exhausting. Like how, how much harder do I have to work and uh, how much more do I have to grow? And if I keep on growing and working harder, nothing actually changes because there is a ceiling here. That's kind of what I concluded in my, in my, in my twenties. And so I, um, you know, this is after the res and dance me outside and ready or not. And, 
Um, and the big thing, which was this bizarre thing that happened, I when when Rent happened. So Rent was the Broadway musical that came to Canada, and we had an original Broadway cast. I was 18 years old at the time. It was the last season of The Res. It was my dream come. Like I wanted to be on Broadway. I loved musical theater. I I got into the show and in Canada I was I was cast as an ensemble player the role was Miss Cohen and she was uh she was you know a, 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 an ensemble character and I would understudy for the lead the lead role then I was transferred to the Broadway company and I was given the lead, the lead role of of Maureen and I was, and I, I just was so confused by it. I was like, well, maybe they don't see back home. Maybe they have ideas about me because they've known me since I was, you know, 15 years old. Maybe it's harder to grow up in a place where they, they already kind of have decided what you're going to be. Maybe you need a whole different world and audience and casting agents and directors who have no idea, no preconceived notion of, of you um, to maybe you need that for someone to imagine you bigger or greater than what you were. So that happened in my, my, in my mid twenties. And that's when a kind of a light bulb went off of maybe you just need a fresh perspective and, um, and rent really rent, rent was really the, the big thing that opened my eyes. Cause that to me was like the biggest job of, of my life. And, and I would just piggyback that with, you know, a, a few years later, um, still coming back here, hustling, my like auditioning and just trying to get another job um, and couldn't, which is when I started my, my music career, but like could not book a TV job or a film job. And then this guy, Sterling Harjo, this like, you know, native filmmaker down in Oklahoma, cast me as the lead female role in his film and, and and again it's like and I don't want to draw these major conclusions that like people down there saw me as something that I that they didn't see me as up here but that was my biggest role and that was the one that won me the Sundance award like that one just blew my world open and for the first time it was like someone saw me as bigger than what I had ever been here and and that was and that's actually when I moved to Los Angeles after after four sheets to the wind um so it's it wasn't just like you know daydreaming at night and coming up with an idea you you know you you work with what is you know what's presented and you're just kind of observing life as it happens around you and you're like something's not working here yeah. um, so wow. that's yeah so I went down there you know, I've I've heard that before, but I didn't know how common it was, especially for Native people involved in any aspect of the Native industry, that they work their butts off and then all of a sudden they have a partnership with someone in the U.S. or they're working with a U.S. company and then all of a sudden they're doing what they've been long ready to do. And that must be just so frustrating. Yeah, and, and I think that I, I'm it was what I did in the moments in between that if I hadn't kept my, you know, if I hadn't kept feeding my spirit and my creativity, um, when that next opportunity shows up, if I would have checked out, I mean, we're talking four years between, you know, of, of me not being able to book a job here that before Sterling called and, 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 and gave me that role. So you know, thankfully, music offered me a space to to yeah. to move that creativity to, and, and I went I went to University of Toronto. I went back to school. I, I was like I never had a chance to do that before, and so and that's where I learned. That's when I was in that the Aboriginal Studies course, which it was called at the time back then, and studied under Alex McKay. And I that's when I might learn Danishnabe Moen, and and like my whole everything changed, and and I started writing in in the language, and like that was just that was the thing that kept me going through it. Um, because I think that the problem in this industry is um, if you can't get through the dry spells, which are spirit crushing, let alone financially um, just uh, terrifying. <laughs> There's no other way just to say it. Um, it then then when that beautiful opportunity does come around, you're either out of shape 
you know, but I was performing and gigging and touring with my band. So that performance thing, like that was all still there. My mind was ready, you know, my body, like I was just, it was, I, I was ready because it's, it's not about, you know, wait for when that moment comes. It's about, are you ready when that moment comes? It's such a good lesson for other people, you know, especially the young people that listen to this podcast. It's such good advice because you can get discouraged in three months, six months, a year, two years, three years, but it's just never give up. Keep working at it in some respect. I mean, it's just phenomenal what you've been able to do, but no one would ever guess that that was your story when you were starting out, that you actually had time when you were unemployed, like, you would never imagine, but it takes all of that apparently to get there, which is one of, you know, related. My other question from students that I usually get is what sort of, did you have education and training in the arts before you went into the arts or did that come after, or did you have a completely irrelevant education? I know you just talked a little no. bit about Native studies. No, um, basically... I, I, I've only recently found out that this program that I I went to, that m me and the other Podemski sisters went to, that um, it no longer exists. So I was very fortunate. I grew up in the city in, in Toronto, and um, uh, there was a pub in, in public school in the public school system. But there was a arts based public school that you had to audition for, and it was um, it was called Claude Watson School for the Performing Arts. You went in when you were you auditioned when you were eight years old and uh it went from grade four to grade 13 so you basically 10 years you're in this specialized arts program where uh, myself and jen and sarah all went um the alumni from there is crazy i can't go anywhere in the music industry dance industry uh film tv uh without without working with or seeing my fellow claude watson alumni and this is like all over um uh, north america but um the, the programs no, no longer exists. Uh, so I, I just feel incredibly, uh, incredibly lucky that I was around at that time when this programming was available to the public school, um, to just like regular public school. The only thing that we had to do was audition. And, um, and, uh, and I actually, and, and sorry, it wasn't even that. And I always need to, to acknowledge my grade three teacher because it was only if your grade three teacher happened to pick you out and say, I see something special in you. Wow. Here is a letter. Take this home to your to your folks and see if if you might be interested in that. And from my school, um, there was uh, three of us who received this letter. Um, and then, wow. and you know, you just it's it. There's so many people who need to be involved. <laughs> in in connecting the dots because um and that was mr barker i remember his name and Aww. i mean i i i imagine he's still around and um if he wouldn't have seen that you know in a seven-year-old little me trying to make sense of the world and see the cre creativity come out in just your regular public school um and then of course my dad had to follow through with it and take us to the auditions and then also you know, all the extracurricular stuff, you know, my dad always put us into dance classes and theater classes. He, 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 he would barter sometimes, um, you know, to, to be able to pay for, he was a single dad. And, um, and um, yeah, I, I'd say the bulk, because there wasn't any kind of specialized training, the bulk of my training really did come from that um, program at Claude Watson, where I was actually a dance major for, for, you know, eight of those 10 years, um, but had access to uh, all the all the drama, the drama programs. But even still, even in that program, I auditioned from the, all the musicals from from like grade six on, never got into any of them. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe I just, well, I, I, I was late to bloom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's phenomenal though. I've never even heard of a public school like that. You hear all the time about famous like ballet schools or violin schools or, you know, and it's like, you know, costs a billion dollars and people rarely get in, but I've never heard of a public school that was arts based, which yeah. imagine if all of our communities had something like that, like just it's night and day what what you learn and absorb. So, you know, you might not have 
been picked to be the star of any school play, but you were living it, you were breathing that it, you were so around true. it. Exactly. It's like that stuff just oozes yeah. in. And yeah. I, I mean, uh, to me, that seems like, you know, in your foundational years, that would be far even more impactful than if, say, in university, you said, oh, I'm going to go take, you know, fine arts or something. Exactly. I think the other thing is that because it was a, 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 a specialized arts program, the teachers themselves, the qualifications were not just your regular teaching degree. They had to be artists themselves. So we were being taught by artists. And the guest teachers that came in were artists. So all you're yeah. seeing are professional right so so many times when we're like when we're young young in the world like looking around at what the possibilities are of what to be if you don't see examples of it you know people don't even know that acting directing set designing storyboard artist you know um uh, 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 um animator like these things that they might love that they do anyway doodling in their both things that they wouldn't even consider this is actually a real job but if you don't see an example of it but all all we saw were like professional dancers that would come in and like that's your full-time job you're a dancer all the time <laughs> you know and and or you know like you're, you're hearing things about disney cruise lines like the, the, seeing where people are applying these dance skills if they're not in a, a modern dance company then they're you yeah. know um performing on the big stage or they're on a cruise ship and it's just it, it was it was the exposure to these that and uh, being an artist was not only a profession but was a respectable kind of citizen in society yeah and, and contrary to the way it's portrayed exactly. at least when i went to you know elementary and junior high school yeah. it was not portrayed that way at all i didn't yeah. even know that those were viable options those are the kind of things you did after school in yeah. an after school program <laughs> but if you really want to make it in life you know forget your dreams become yeah. a engineer or yeah, an accountant or something and yeah. they don't they just cut it right off when yeah. you're so you don't even have an opportunity to yeah. let the creative juices flow or be around people with creativity exactly. what, what a what an amazing yeah. thing and did you say your other sisters were able to be in that public school too yeah yeah, all three of us. Wow. Well, I shouldn't be surprised because look at all of you today. You're just like doing amazing things. Yeah, it was a really, a really special place. And um, my son uh, is in grade three right now. So I got very excited and not that we were ready to you know, move back to the city. But I knew that like if he if he could have that, that might be worth considering moving back to the city. So I looked into it and uh, all those specialized, so this is a Tobacco School for the Arts, Cawthra School for the Arts. These are, these are publicly funded arts-based curriculum schools in the Toronto District School Board um, that as of, uh, yeah, it was like the last two years they were transitioning them out and now there are no longer any um, kind of audition, like where you would audition to get in, like a mm -hmm. place that fosters young, young artists it's all gone it's done it was heartbreaking that, that's terrible i mean yeah. that's 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 so terrible and think of all of the people that were involved in that yeah. like you mentioned your father in terms of doing all the extracurricular stuff all the support but your teacher a teacher that you had who just happened to be a loving caring compassionate yeah. visionary teacher yeah. who would support a young indigenous child yeah. to have that opportunity and yeah. Like it goes to show the importance of teachers too, not just uh -huh. teaching one, two, threes, but to to support people's hopes and dreams. Like yeah. that's did you have any other mentors along the way outside like outside of that school? Were you, you know, meeting and hanging out with other people who were in that same kind of art? Well, I think the uh, because we didn't really have much of a a like we didn't have a family that was in the business like nobody we didn't we didn't know a bunch of people like that oh, so wow. like my my dad is you know he was a copywriter he was a you know in advertising my mom was a indian rights activist you know and she was kind of doing her thing um there there were no artists or anyone who kind of knew anything about the entertainment business um but bizarrely um, my my mom, who comes from a very prominent Baha'i family in Saskatchewan, 
um, and the Baha'i community is very tight also. So even though there's a big indigenous Baha'i community, the larger Baha'i community, um, everyone knows each other. And one of the biggest uh, Baha'i uh, music producers, is his name is Jack Lenz, and he was producing Buffy St. Marie's. Um, I think he, he'd either produced her, her one of her albums or um, he was producing a song um, that she was in with um, Seals and Crofts and it was a music video and he needed, they, they wanted some more native people in the video because Buffy was there and it was um, about this famous um, um, Iranian uh, um, young girl, Mona, Mona Mahmoud Nazad, who was, um, who was hung for refusing, by, by refusing to, um, to stop teaching the children um, all the Baha'i teachings. And um, they made a music video about her. All these big Canadian uh, singers came out and they asked us to be in the music video. So I think Sarah was like four years old. I might've been seven. Jen was like, I don't know, 10, 10 or 11. And Buff, and we're there beside Buffy. Wow. <laughs> and that was our first music video. So um, to, to be like, that was just a little bit of a, a taste of like, what the heck is this? Like, and also that the importance of political protest for standing up for your beliefs, for seeing that this was art, art is connected to, you know, using your voice and, 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 and it's its own movement, that it's not just for fun and entertainment the the song which i have wanted to do a cover of his name is doug cameron it's a stunning song um but that was the first time that i met buffy, that i met buffy and so it was it, like that was a, a total like a, a a moment i remember in my young impressionable life and then the next one would be the same producer knew that uh um you know i, I was a singer and he he had me uh, he told me about this this um, choir called the inner city uh, in inner city youth gospel choir, and it was Michelle St. John's dad, so one of our beloved um, uh, talents uh, actresses at the time. Michelle had just done um, uh, that film, that CBC film about residential school. Uh, wind. Uh, oh my gosh, it's escaping me right now. Um, I don't know if you remember this film, but it was it was a, a CBC movie. It was it was uh, uh, Michelle and Jenny Lazam, Monique Mojica were, were in it, um, and and that was like the only native like super like TV star that I that I knew at the time, and I was invited to to be in the choir with them. And so these were just and I was twelve years old at the time, and we toured to to New York. We sang with Rafi. We were his backup choir. It was oh, just like, wow. it, it was uh, again, like, and it was through this Baha'i connection. Um, but it was this like exposure to, to the arts, but through, um, through service, right? Like Rafi, for all those who know Rafi, like this is one of our, uh, like what he does for the environment, what he does for children, what he does for, for this kind of um, just the peace movement. <laughs> it's just, I will love him forever and always, but that uh, he was my introduction to, you know, like that those two things were my introduction to the, the, the industry, right? This industry that we now know is a monster unto itself. I had a very different introduction. And I think that that was fundamental in, in how I, how I learned to weave my art into my politics, into my kind of my, my citizenship in, in like how I, how I um, use it to just be a better citizen in the world. It seems like of all the different kinds of professions and interests and dreams that people have, I can think of none that weave better together than the arts and advocacy, yeah. you know, because I, everything about the arts inspires people, you know, during I don't know more, there was people doing I don't know more music videos, you know, there's artists doing these amazing pieces of artwork that we, we would use as our protest signs. Yeah. And, yeah. and the fact that both of them are about voice, mm -hmm. like, that's just, 
this is the best I've ever heard. Uh, Cause sometimes <laughs> you might hear someone, you know, Oh, well I was a writer and then I got into writing, whatever, but if this is literally the two best ways, I think you could use your voice. I, I, I've, I mean, I've talked about the beginning of my career so many times. Um, and this is the first time that I've made the connection that those were my first introductions and from, from such, I mean, world leaders, you know, yeah. of, of peace and, um, and equality and inclusion and, and promotion of arts. Buffy and Rafi, man. So yeah, thank you. Cause I, that, that just something connected there. Yeah. <laughs> my, my young impressionable brain. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Think about, I mean, everything about Buffy. Everybody knows Buffy. I mean, she's it's a phenomenal artist and she's such a sweet and awesome person. And she overcame these horrific challenges and barriers to her being successful. And she was all about Native rights and still about Native rights. And Rafi, I mean, this guy is human rights and planetary <laughs> rights and love for people and peace. I mean, th that's your art. I mean, it's just so fundamentally different from how you see other people get into it. So that that's a phenomenal story. I love it that the, they're, those two are part of it. I mean, that must you must think about that all the time. No, I, 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 I think about I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, their influence is everywhere around me. Um, but I, I never really made the connection of how closely I mean you know 10 years old to 12 years old in in that in that that they how responsible they were for shaping my my idea that's about awesome. art art and activism yeah I love those I love those stories but then there's always the counter so you know when you talk to Buffy and she's just loves people loves the world loves yeah. entertainment she's just got this sweet loving voice like you you're just you remind me of her like when i was watching your video your song mcgwitch yeah and how you're just like walking around and you're so happy and grateful and positive about everything and seeing the beauty and things i was like oh wow that just looks like buffy to me <laughs> and then on the other side of things i think okay well buffy is also very honest about some of the challenges. Now you've talked a little bit about how here in Canada, you weren't getting the same roles or gigs or opportunities mm -hmm. as you were in the United States, but did you have any other challenges um, that you had to overcome? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing which ends up being, you know, what I credit with um, my, my real, um, fight for for life, um, I think, comes from growing up in a in an alcoholic home with you know a mother who was really struggling and and living out what we now know are the effects of intergenerational trauma of you know being the child of two residential school survivors. Um, my dad on the other side is, is the son of a Holocaust survivor. Um, there's a lot of unspoken stuff that happened, you know, in, in, in the home that played out in unspoken, but other, other ways. And, and yeah, it was a, a, a pretty um, destabilizing, scary, scary world for, for a child to grow up in. And I know that I turned to art for, a way to move that anxious energy, that scared energy. Um, and also both my parents are, are you know, beautiful spirits on, on their own. So I inherited so much from, from them that even if maybe they didn't know how to move it out in a healthy way, um, they, they gave me so many stories and, and, and tools and reminders as to why we're here, who we come from, what the responsibility is. So those those things were given to us at a very young age, which I think sometimes is a lot to um, to to take for young people. And even with the in workshops that I've done with um, with with youth, I know that especially the youth of, of today, what I hear a lot sometimes is it's it's too much. It's too much to to be put on. Of, of what they have to carry because now there's nothing that's not unspoken. Now everything's out there and, and here it all is. And now let's deal with it all and, 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 and go and take it. And so 
I think it was, you know, um, these were all, this was, you know, in the eighties. So this was, this was all, um, a time of like therapy was, was, was now a big thing. Right. So we were put in out, you know, Al-Anon very young age. Oh, we wow. were, we were introduced to the language of, of, of trauma and of recovery and addiction very young. Um, and, and that I know the arts saved me and the way that I could move the energy process, the emotions that came out of that. Um, and so what was very challenging at the time and, uh, and all through, you know, just teenagehood, <laughs> um, ended up being the, the experience that gave me the tools. That's where I learned the tools of how to, how to get through it, of how, um, you know, not to fall into victimization of my circumstances. Um, and, and, and that, that kept me going for, for a really long time. And still, you, until you start to see patterns repeat in your own life. And so, you know, getting married very young and, and, um, and dealing with, you know, recurring people in my life with addictions and you just see things cause they're cycles and cycles will just continue until you choose to break them. And, um, and so I, I feel like my life is now um, at a place of, of some, I wouldn't say, you know, or of some ease or some better manageability because of the tools that I have sharpened oh. <laughs> over the years. And, and, um, and, and cycles that have been, that have been broken that I have broken. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. You, you should take credit for the effort you put into those things. You weren't the maker of those, yeah. you know, very significant challenges, but the fact that you, you found your way. And these are the stories which, you know, it always makes my heart sad because you never know what's behind someone who is just sharing light and love everywhere, you know, and like your face, your videos, like you, you just share light and love everywhere. You never know the backstory. But I think about the younger people who listen to mm -hmm. people's stories like yours, mm -hmm. who might be sitting in their home right now, experiencing mm -hmm. some of the same things you did thinking, I can't do this. Yeah. There's no way I can do this. Life is too hard. I can't do this. And, and it, it, it was hard. I'm sure it was hard processing that, but you show, you know, never give up on yourself yeah. because there's bad things happening in your life that you're not in control of. Yeah. but never give up on yourself. Yeah. And I've always wanted to be, I've been working with youth since I was kind of a, a youth myself, but I, I found that there was only, things only got better. The connections only got better. They only trusted me more when I was honest. And so we've all, and, and from, I know how Jen and, and um, you know, and, and Sarah have shared their stories as well. And we've always been honest about um, our, our upbringing I think because of that, I the, the the worst thing about, or the worst byproduct of whatever kind of um, um, fame I might have or being well known would be for people to make draw conclusions mm -hmm. about how easy or how um, or how uh, far away it is from their world. And so it was always very important for me to share that story. I think the other thing that was also we were always very open about, which you know, is now catching up to people in life <laughs> right now as we, as with what's going on with people's, um, you know, I identity and um, being called out for, for who, what, you know, communities they're a part of. But very early on, because we were mixed, um, but in our careers, we weren't Jewish actresses. You know, our dad was, uh, you know, was, was Jewish and Ashkenazi and, and our, our, our mom was Anishinaabe. And we look the way that we do. We were we never pretended to be anything else. We were called half breeds all our life, so we just kind of owned our half breedness, and we were always just really, um, just really open about it, and, and not shame, not, uh, not uh, didn't carry. Well, maybe we just owned it. 
you know, it, it was always used against us because, you know, on, on either side. Um, but something felt better about just being really honest about it. And I think also we were urban Indians and, you know, all of our cousins, you know, we had the rest of our family back on the res, like just all those um, ideas and those identity politics that were happening way back in, in the 80s. I and mean, we only got our, we got our status back, you know, from Bill C-35, like that's, those are, that's the status Indians that we come from um, when my mom got hers back um, with Bill C-35. But there were always those, those, um, those issues going on. And I, I felt even with that, like, it only it only helped because if at the time you know urban indians were making up 50% of the indigenous population in canada then we couldn't be the ones that are less than you know and if mixed race you know native people were also making up a massive part of the indigenous population this can't be something that we are ashamed for less than this is actually just as valid an indigenous experience and um and so that was all also really important for us to be open about that because even though that's it's not technically a you know that wasn't a you know i guess it does it's just another another hardship for a young person to have to to battle um when you get those kind of accusations or or, or shaming for that those kinds of things having lived been an urban indian uh as well that those things can create lifelong insecurities that not only are something that you might be self-aware of, but become so deeply rooted, you're not even aware that you react to things and people based on those insecurities. I mean, the vast majority of us, according to the statistics anyway, the vast majority of First Nations people um, have mixed ancestry, but we're not a race of people, but we've been taught yeah. that we're a race and that you measure blood or whether someone has brown eyes or blue eyes. And so all the people with blue eyes, you're not a real Indian. Or if you don't live on the res, even though it's like a little tiny pocket stamp of our giant territory, you know, like all of these things, th those are also challenges, you know, growing up. And to me, the thing about the whole pretendian thing that upsets me the most you know, I don't like what they're doing, especially in the entertainment industry. I mean, that's been going on for a long time. It's that all of the people who are reconnecting, who got their status back from Bill C-31 or C-3 or S-3 or with this current bill coming up C-38, they're all going to carry with them this insecurity that they're they're not Indian enough. Yeah. And, the, and this issue around pretendians is going to confuse everybody else. Oh, you're just trying to be, you know, you're a pretendian. And it's confusing the lines yeah. of who we are as a people. And I, I just, I feel like people like you in the entertainment industry, in the art world, in everything you do are just so much more important because, okay, there's an anchor. I can anchor myself to as a, a native trailblazer. She's always been a native trailblazer, you know, always will be instead of in this weird world of, well, I don't know, is, is that person native? Some of the things they're saying doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Like you're leading in those ways too. Yeah. Well, um, I, I just realized you could, it's Bill, Bill C-31. I said Bill C-35. <laughs> That's the right one. Yeah. You know, there, there's so many different conversations where that matters of you know who who we can like whose voice can be trusted and you wouldn't think you know you look in education and how that that or or, or um you know in, in grant world you know who, who's getting the funding and, and you can see how really important it is there and you wonder like well how, why is it that important in in the entertainment business you know when you're you have an actor who, who might not be a trusted voice or who may be misrepresenting their lived experience to be able to portray a character who they're not really anyway. And so it's, it's a, I feel like when it comes to the acting world, it doesn't seem to have as much weight that how important it is. But I don't think people understand that as actors, we're not, we don't just show up and read the lines. We are given a script and you you read it and you have a say if it doesn't track as authentic or 
respectful. And it doesn't mean that I only play good characters, like good characters or that I can't play flawed women. That's my favorite. I love playing flawed people. Like they're just, that's just real people. I think the difference is if you have a legitimate, authentic, lived experience, lived experience that is informed by the indigenous reality of today, um, what you're bringing to that script and to what is, in, in, in my world, mostly non-Indigenous people, um, it's only your voice that is the one that's standing up for that character. Like, oh, like now, let's say la the last two years when I'm on reservation dogs is the first time you have a full writer's room of, of, of Indigenous writers. <laughs> But even in Coroner, with this role that was not a Native role, I just got cast in it. And, and in, in my sharing of what my backstory was for my character, that's when I introduced this murdered and missing woman storyline of my mother. And then they brought in an Indigenous writer and we wrote a whole episode yes. devoted to that. Yes. And then we had Anishinaabe in it. And then we yes. had like child welfare brought into it. And that doesn't happen if somebody comes in that might perfectly actually satisfy a native actress more than I do, but cannot bring any of those other truths or realities. And, and, and in outer range, like I got to dress her office, like for Sheriff Joy, when they're showing their home and their, and, and, and her office, those art directors, I, I was in, contact with them like oh, the wow. way that they included me and I said it's it's the sheriff's office she needs a smut she needs her medicines behind her she needs <laughs> and they're like what medicines tell me what, what do you mean medicines and you're like you know um she needs I mean someone gifted her with the Pendleton mug right like these are just yeah. gifts that we know yes. like, we just have to have these signs there and in her sheriff's car you know she has the sweet grass around the mirror like props mm. and everyone allowed me because they don't know. That's not their job to do that. It's not even though that's not their job. Their job is to dress the set. They can do as much re as much research, research as they want, but they don't know those little things. But you know what? If, those are the things that Indigenous audiences are noticing. They're noticing my beaded holster. Yes! And that was a thing that when I was with props and we were talking about it, and I was like, but imagine her going through you know, the, 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 the Indian police Academy in, in, in the States, mm -hmm. imagine her family, you know, and I came up with, you know, the kind of family and the, the, how, how much they're just, they're such cheerleaders of her. Yeah. What would you gift, you know, yeah. your, your, your daughter who just graduated from the police Academy, you get her a beaded holster, like the, those little things. And it was huge. And their excitement and willingness to say, tell us, just tell us. And they gave me all these different wow. bead patterns. We based it on Shoshone different uh patterns but also with something that would just be a little personalized for her yeah. those things don't happen if if you don't know how those life moments are celebrated yes in kind of the indian way you know <laughs> and and yes i also have the privilege of being brought up with those with those teachings so um it's not to say that everyone had had, had access to that but I, yeah. I do i do know the difference between when when we're on set using our voice to deepen and enrich the story or correct it yeah like even beyond the script that's the thing that just makes me so excited when you see someone on tv and they're wearing a land back t-shirt and you're like yeah. yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yes so it's not what they're yeah. saying it's that yeah that's exactly how we dress or that's how yeah. we look or yeah look at the smudge bowl or yeah. just the funny sayings like skoden and all that yeah. other yeah. stuff like that means so much at least it does to me and, and yeah. then I think about how you can miss out on that if you hire these pretendians who are just like oh no. I'm an ancestry person yeah. because think about the old days the only people that played Indians on TV were yeah. white people with painted faces and they yeah. did all the stereotypes. And now we're in this new wave of real native people yeah. speaking the way they are, yeah. they dress yeah. and yeah. all of this yeah. other stuff. You put someone in there who only knows the Wikipedia stereotypes. Yeah. And then it's like, 
what what do you mean it's like every her skirt's a dream catcher there's a dream catcher yeah. in the window all she yeah. talks about <laughs> is dream catcher teachings and none of these make sense and it it hurts us yeah. but there's no way i think the entertainment industry could really understand the depth of why it's important to have people like you there who actually have that like yeah. To me, it just makes me excited thinking about all the ways in which yeah. Native voices have are now represented. And, and so I, I think it's important. I know some people don't like calling out like pretendians, but I, I think it's important for all the reasons maybe people don't understand yeah. that we don't lose that authenticity that it took so long yeah. to get into the forward facing things that we do. Yeah. And I also don't want to say, you know, that they're completely incapable of performing their duties as an actor because that's, you know, they, they may be doing that. And, but I, what hurts me the most is, are missed opportunities, especially at a time when we're finally getting opportunities. Yes. So yeah. that like, what always is just like, it just is so painful to, to see is this could have been something Oh, this could have been bigger if you just wouldn't said or shown or done. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's where I'm. That's why I always just am. I'm just looking for how can we deepen. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know yeah. what? What more can we do? But then sometimes it, it just bites in the ass. Like the fact is, we are still Canadian. You know, going down to Tulsa. So S S Sarah, my sister, you know, plays Reed on on Reservation Dogs. We when we had our big anti episode, and and you know. Devry's also, you know, Canadian. Um, um, Danis Goulet was uh, directing the one of those episodes um, where uh, where the the grandmother dies, and um, and so we had a bunch of Canadians on set. We're all in kind of like a funeral wake deal, and uh, and Sarah and I are drinking tea, and they were they were like, "What are you doing drinking tea? We don't we don't drink tea." They're like, and it's also almost impossible to get tea in Tulsa. Like when you go to the Starbucks, when you'd go and drive. To, to drink, really? They don't have tea. Like they're just not a, a tea drinking people. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, why didn't you tell us? We're sitting here like with our tea, you know, just being yeah. real like, real like homely aunties. <laughs> and, and, and that's totally not right. Like there, he was just like. Well, maybe that's because you guys went to the city a couple of times. Let's, let's, well, you know, like there's, a, there could be a reason why you guys are drinking tea because we don't drink tea. Wow. Well, I like, I love it. Like the, all of these nuances and, and experiences, like think of all of the contributions, not just to us, all the fans out there, native fans, but to the whole industry. Think yeah. about what they're learning in fairly short order. When you look yeah. at the length of like entertainment, yeah. And and this rush for native actors and actresses yeah. and musicians, but also yeah. the people behind the scenes. That's what I love about you. You're also writing and producing like for people who don't know, um, you'll know now. Uh, one of the ways I was first introduced to Tamara was when she was writing for and, and producing this series for um, called uh, future history, which was just celebrating all these different aspects of really cool native people. And I got to be a part of it. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and you never, you know, it wasn't like Tamara was on the screen being featured and all of that other stuff. She was the one behind the scenes, putting it all together and writing oh. it. So we're kicking butt, it, you know, in front of the cameras, but also behind the cameras. Like how, how much do you really enjoy the producing part of things versus the being the actress part of things? Um, I, I enjoy it very much. I, I loved making future history, mostly because it, the, the student in me, like the researcher in me was like, just happy. I mean, it had been years since I'd been in school, but researching all of you guys um, was, was so fun. I mean, sometimes my, my man would come down and I'd be like bawling my eyes out, just like reading read Cause we featured, I think it was three and 13 episodes or no, maybe two people every three. It was, it was a lot of people that I had to research and then, and then piece together of, of who would compliment best in what episodes. But sometimes the stories would just, would just floor me. And it just felt like such important work. And in, in, in one way, 
I only know community work is kind of being on the ground, um, you know, with the people. And Future History was like writing that show felt like community work, but like from a distance, like that I was able to kind of learn and connect and, and, um, and empower and promote like my community, but just from a distance. I mean, that, that part I didn't like because I didn't get to be with any of you. <laughs> I didn't get to meet and like the the oh. filming of yeah I just yeah but, but I I I like also when I am surprised by something and I was surprised by how fulfilling it could be um to 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 kind of be alone in my own space and you know as as it must be for you of so much of your work is by yourself writing at a computer. <laughs> I was surprised because I think I had ideas. I'm I'm a performer. I like the interaction. I obviously like the real time engagement with people. So I was surprised at how fulfilling it actually was. And I'm grateful to my sister to give me, you know, to gift me with that with that job. Obviously, you know, with it, you know, there's nepotism. But if 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 you can't, uh, if I couldn't deliver the then that would be one thing I, I actually was able <laughs> was able to do the job so I feel and, and I got and I got nominated for a, a, a Canadian screen award for that so I, I I I can trust now that it wasn't just nepotism it was I I had the skill to do it yes um but I but you know it was a very funny way that it came about because usually Jen produces her she just does everything on her own I mean she has great teams with her but she she was writing I think most of her stuff and then producing it and shooting it, directing it and doing all that. But she's, she became part of the union and um, they couldn't afford her <laughs> yeah, yeah. because she was now part of the Writers Guild of Canada. Oh. Um, I was not. And so she was like, <laughs> do you want to write the show? And it's, it's, it's a, you know, I'm sure it's a classic story for how many yeah. writers get into the business that you just yeah. start off as a non-union writer and, but that show is actually how I got into the union. Um, okay. So that was my that was ticket in there. And and um, I think it was also just someone else believing in you that you yes. were capable of that. And so the first season, I was just a researcher and a writer. And then the second season, I was more of a story editor where I was I, re I was given a, a greater credit, which mm -hmm. acknowledged how I pieced together the, those stories. And then, um, and then that really just, it was just, the, the extra push I needed to really believe that I, I could write. So since then, I mean, I have a screenplay in development. I have a TV series in development. I, I, I love the writing. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so awesome. And I just had to raise it because one of the things I liked about all of the people that worked on that, especially future history is all in covering it and in featuring, you know, different people, you're also helping to support them and promote them and lifting up their voices to people who might not have seen it. Like here we were sitting down and I was doing a podcast yeah. interview with Serene <laughs> and then, and then that get the part of that gets featured and it's like, wow, now people know about my podcast. Yes. Like, all of these ways of, keep lifting each other up yeah. and and that you know I just thought wow that's what it means and you know I'll just have to say I know we're uh, almost at the end here but I, I hate the word nepotism because it's only used in certain circumstances like if you think about us and our traditional like all of our traditions we raise people to be a good hunter you, you raise yeah. your son to be a good hunter like yeah. the father like the uncle like the you know and then they become like the lead hunter or the war chief and all of these other things similarly think about in the american and canadian context the people who have businesses trust first and foremost their families so yeah. of course they're all the board of directors of course they work for them you mentor them from you know cashier to supervisor yeah, to yeah. manager to like owner so why on earth couldn't we say hey yeah. i'm gonna mentor my sister yeah. to, to be this and give her those opportunities and i don't think anything is wrong with that i think no, that's a either. good thing it's just such a trend right now, right? It's like yeah. the, I, that the whole Nepo baby thing. I mean, obviously we're not Nepo babies and yeah. we've like worked our asses off to get to, to where we are. Yeah. But I, I do I, I do want to, it, it's important for me to remember, I mean, as I always do, just those are 
you know, if if access and opportunity are sometimes the things that hindrance us, it just reminds me every door that was open to me. Yes. And 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 that and how and how much a part of I mean that is so much of of who we are too. Mentorship is such a big part of Huge. how we work, and it is it is all it's and 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 the passing it on. Um, so uh, it's it's. Yeah, and even you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my body healthy again. I'm, I'm, I'm working out really hard. I'm like harder than I've ever worked out before. I was, it was, I was so red. I was like, I was so hot. Like a half an hour before we started talking, I was like, I don't even know how to get my face out. I was just, I'm, I'm still hot to the touch. But my sister, like, so, so Jen calls me yesterday, and she was just like, um, I got on the spin bike today. You're just, you're really inspiring what you're doing. And uh, I just needed, you know, it's like it, it, and if we share what we're going yes. through and that I don't look like superwoman, that's like going and hitting the gym every day, yeah. but I'm very vocal about how hard it has been to not have this in my life and how important it is to my mental health and to my body. And so I'm sharing my experience and in sharing it, that then you know, stirred something inside her. And then she hit on the spin bike and I just got a message from her. She just hit the spin bike for the second time, oh my <laughs> you know, but like, but that's the thing. We must share these stories. That's why, yes. you know, I love being part of this show and love the work that you do because we share the stories. It sparks something in our listeners. Yes. And they talk and then they start and it just, it just, it just spreads and we just end up empowering and lifting all each other. Yes. And it just goes to show you, we can be beautifully imperfect mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. all of those ways. And as long as we share that and be honest yeah. about it, then right. someone else can say, well, then I can do that yeah. too, because I'm beautifully imperfect as well. Just reminds yeah. me of your video, that McGwitch video yeah. over and over and over. <laughs> you just like literally ooze positivity and gratefulness. And I could talk to you for, you know, a thousand more hours. Like, <laughs> I didn't even... I didn't even get to any of the questions that I wanted. Sorry, to I talked a lot too. I, I take twice as long for one answer. Like, no, 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 no. Because these are like, you know, I can make my podcast whatever I want. But just hearing your story and, and all of your perspectives, like that's the goal. Anybody can ask you about, hey, what was it like writing this show or that show? But I want the life story. I want all the lessons learned. And that's just that's just gold. Thank you so much for being here and being part of my podcast. I feel like that's, you know, I just got this superstar on my podcast. It's <laughs> phenomenal. And thank you for all the work you do behind the scenes that people don't see. The mentorship, the inspirations, your the positivity and love that you just ooze all over the place. Like you're a real inspiration to me and so many others. Oh my goodness, Chimmy Gwitch. Thank you so much. You are you are my superstar. That's why we put you on the show. <laughs> Uh, I love it. I love it. Thank you. I'm going to take that and live with that all day. Just make me happy. And thank you to all the listeners for actually taking the time to hear real Native people's voices, to learn what they're going through, to heed their calls to action. Because when you know better, you now have the opportunity to do better. Support Indigenous creatives in whatever way you can. You know, shout their names, promote, the, promote this podcast so everyone else gets to hear you know, the amazing award-winning Pademski and, <laughs> and everything she's got done and, and she's going to do in the future. So share it all over the place, like, comment, you know, the usual. Until next time, keep living a warrior life. Wulalia. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting my podcast. Your donations help me keep the Warrior Life podcast open access to everyone and free from those annoying ads. And it's super simple. Just click on the link below to sign up for a Patreon monthly or yearly subscription, or click the links for the Buy Me A Coffee app or the Kofi app to make one-time contributions. And if you belong to an awesome community group, business, or organization that's committed to Indigenous reconciliation, consider sponsoring an episode or two, or as many as you like. Thank you for helping me lift the voices of Indigenous warriors doing phenomenal things to help make our world a better place.